All right. Welcome, everybody, to our TUM AI lecture. Um, it's a real pleasure to have Katerina Fragiadaki today here. She's a professor at CMU at the machine learning department. Um, prior, she was a postdoc with Chitendra and working at Google Research in Mountain View. Um, she got her PhD from UPenn, and her work is at the intersection of machine learning and computer vision. And everybody in the community, of course, knows her work. Um, she's done a lot of exciting and impressive works on self-supervised 3D scene representations and object representations. In, in particular, she's a, she's a pioneer on disentanglement on 3D and dynamic representations in neural networks. And I think that's a super exciting area. And to no surprise, she already has received many, many awards in her early career stage. So I'm really happy to have you here today um, and really happy what you're going to talk about. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I'm also extremely happy to be here. Um, I love the work from your group. I follow it very closely. Um, yeah, and, and please feel free to ask questions throughout the talk. Um, that would definitely make it more, um, you know, interesting for everybody. Um, so we are all interested on the problem of 3D scene understanding. Look at the scene. This is my office. Uh, no matter how many months go by, it looks pretty similar. Uh, actually, here is the cup again. Same thing. And this video was taken a long time ago. And uh, this scene that for us is so easy to perceive, it's very hard for, for neural networks. Wh why it makes it hard? What makes it hard? Well, first of all, the, the camera motion. Camera motion is hard. Well, for us, somehow we can stabilize. If Even if somebody else takes the video, we manage to somehow cancel camera motion and make sense of the pixels. Um, and so CNNs and for super frame processing cannot do that uh, yet. So we don't have uh, effective ways to represent object permanence. The fact that objects do not disappear. Objects do not move, rather the camera is moving so we cannot easily disentangle the scene from uh, the camera. Uh, again, as you zoom in and out, it appears that the object is the same size while in fact the camera is moving. And uh, the, the main problem is that the camera motion is entangled with the scene appearance in 2D images and videos. Okay. And uh, I mean, robotics people have realized this long time ago and developed excellent slam systems, which keep improving uh, with combination of learning uh, modules and uh, geometric, uh, well studied geometric modules. And what slam does is exactly this disentanglement takes a video. And then it separates it on the camera motion and the camera poses, as you see here, these are the blue triangles and the point cloud of the scene. And there is permanence, like look at this steady bear. It was not there in all the video frames, but it's there in the point cloud map. This scene is static, only the camera is moving. Yet SLAM does provide a solution um, in case the motion estimation is effective and it's not, there's not just very fast motions and so on to do this disentanglement, okay? So, so given that this does, this does have some desired properties, how can SLAM and deep learning be combined? Okay. What's the problem with SLAM, first of all? Uh, SLAM cannot do a modal completion. So what does a modal completion mean? It means that no matter how much I go around office scenes, how many times, like this one, next time that I will go in an office scene, again, I need to move around everywhere. As you see here, there is very dense camera motion all over the scene to be able to capture this dense point cloud map, okay? And what time particularly tricked the last two, three years is how the brain does that without actually us going around all the time at each new scene. Somehow we fill in the details. We see the surface and we fill in the what's uh, behind, uh, right? Um, and the question is, what are these architectures that would permit us to learn to do this uh, and, and would hopefully allow to permit us to do this without uh, supervision, just by moving uh, around, okay? Uh, so, yeah, and this model conclusion is a big part of special common sense that humans have, right? They don't need to see everything. They see very little and they complete actually a lot. So what has happened in 3D representations? Uh, amazing progress uh, the last uh, years. Uh, here I'm just showing a few papers. Uh, we have very good, um, you know, methods that actually take images as input and spit out uh, 3D reconstructions. These are assume the problem of these methods that they're object category specific, they assume a specific object category. And, um, you know, the goal is how do you make excellent 3D occupancy predictions 
And recently, with those implicit functions, now we don't even have a uh, discretization artifacts and so on. Um, and we have these nice smooth surfaces. Uh, and the, most importantly, they assume, you know, we have already great object detectors and segmentors. And the goal here is to do the lifting. How do you go from 2D to uh, 3D? All right. And um, now here I'm showing, uh, showing a recent work from, from NERF that take lots of images of a scene and they make a nice 3D model. And again, here, the main goal of those works is how do you render beautiful photorealistic images, right? So, so they care about graphics. Uh, and in fact, I think this is also one confusion. How doing excellent rendering of images, beautiful and photorealistic, how much this ability will help the inverse process of going from images back to the you know, latent state of the world, what the objects are, what are their poses, and all the other variables we would need to actually uh, you know, excel in the end task. And the end task is not rendering good images, but rather recognizing the objects and act confidently in the world. Let's say we want to build intelligent artificial agents. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, these questions actually are, are open. Okay. Uh, They're open. And uh, here we have Rodney Brooks, who back in 1991, when everybody in computer vision community was very much, um, you know, deep, deep learning was not big back then, right? It had to make a big boom uh, in machine learning even, neither. Uh, and people were very interested in 3D reconstruction from, uh, from videos. And then here, R Rod is saying that such 3D reconstructions complete representations of the external environment. They're both hard to get, but they're also not necessary potentially for the end task. And the end task is to make agents that act competently in the world, okay? Uh, and so the question is, how much 3D we need versus 2D, to 3D or not to 3D? What do we need to capture and what we don't need to capture and so on? Um, so trying to answer the above questions, one solution we had a couple of years ago um, was to pursue 3D representations, pursue persistency and stable uh, you know, maps of the scene, but not in terms of point clouds, but rather in terms of features, feature clouds or feature grids. And those features, from these features, you can decode whatever you care for the end task. So if you care to decode occupancy, you can decode occupancy. But if you care to decode how can I pick up this mug, then you're just going to train these features to predict success of your grasp or not. If you want to detect your objects, you're going to train those features for 3D object detection and so on. Uh, so we try not to put the 3D construction as the intermediate uh, task, but rather go directly from images to 3D features to uh, end tasks, okay? Um, so what I'll discuss in this talk is how do we are gonna learn those so 3D feature representations and to go from these 2D images to these 3D feature maps, you need to do a model completion. You need to be completing this map even behind in different viewpoints that you actually haven't seen. And um, yeah, and we'll discuss applications in visual tracking, Object detection, occupancy prediction, of course, learning dynamics of objects, how they move under applications of forces, right? Intuitive physics, we also call it. Uh, skill uh, selection and skill learning policy, essentially learning. How do we learn to manipulate objects using these representations? And uh, language grounding, which um, uh, particularly uh, excite the bath. Okay, um, so let's start with the uh, applications in, in vision. So, um, the, the network architecture we have um, investigated the last one year and a half is uh, what we call geometry aware recurrent network that takes images as input. And um, the hidden state is this 3D feature maps that I told you about. They have a width by height, um, by depth. So width by height, by depth, by number of channels. And here, the number of channels I'm showing as a color. So I do PCA on the features and I, keep only the three first dimensions, then I might get an RGB color, right? And that's how I visualize this uh, four-dimensional tensor. Um, and and um, how are these networks different than previous networks? Well, recurrent networks, for example. Well, first of all, they have a three-dimensional state with three special dimensions. And they also have egomotion stabilized, egomotion stable late and state updates. So when we update our hidden state, we take into account egomotion. So let me give you a concrete example of how this works. Um, here is a video sequence 
of a static scene. The scene is not moving, just the camera is moving. It is a scene of, that has a coffee maker. And uh, we take the image and the depth map when it's available and we unproject it. So we put uh, features in the right place. And, and I know your group also had a, um, a, a nice paper at the same time. It was object centric called uh, Super Voxels. I think uh, it was the title, uh, CVPR 19 again. So I'm sure you are, you are uh, aware of those operations. So there is this unprojection and there are these 3D convolutions. Um, okay. Uh, and unfortunately, you cannot use sparse convolutions here because you don't know which part of the scene will be filled and which will going to stay empty, right? You try to do a model completion. So here is your hidden state. And here's the next frame. And again, you featureize it, you lift it in the 3D space, you featureize it, uh, you add your convolutions, and then you need to estimate your 3D rotation and translation from one frame to the next. And the reason you need to do that is because the way you're going to merge these features to the previous features is that you actually won't transform the feature map. So if you move the, to the right, okay, you need to make sure those features are added to the right in the hidden state. They're not going to go and override the previous ones. So you do some geometric, um, let's say, aware feature fusion, okay? So you stabilize essentially the viewpoint. You always keep the coordinate system from the first frame and you just add more frames and add more features in the map and so on. Uh, so it's as if you have a network that is doing slum in its neural bottleneck, right? So instead of a point cloud, now we have a 3D feature map. Again, we have low ego motion estimation. Again, we have feature accumulation and so on, uh, okay? Um, similar to SLAM. Now, what have we gained? Well, what we have gained is um, the stabilization. So here is a point on the handle of the coffee maker. And as the camera is moving, this point changes pixel locations x, y on the image plane. But after this stabilization, this yellow point that moves in image space is actually exactly at the right location in the 3D feature map, all right? Uh, well, if you had the 2D model, a 2D convolution, I mean, transformers hopefully will be able to do better correspondence over time, right? Because they, we have attentions and we are not, uh, you know, uh, a hostage of the convolution operation, but convolutions can definitely not do such ego motion stabilization, right? The, the hidden state will be corrupted and the handle of the coffee maker would be all over in your hidden state. And the hidden state will be mostly a function of how your camera moves as opposed to what is in the scene. And because each time the camera moves differently, it's hard to learn anything useful from that hidden state. So, so what are we going to do now with this bottleneck that we put together? Um, well, we can do whatever we do with CNNs, as I'm gonna show in later. For example, we can detect objects on those feature maps and train the network end-to-end -end since everything is differentiable. Now, I just wanna mention here that the estimation of ego motion is not trained end-to-end -end for the end task. This is the only module that needs to be separately trained. Okay, you want to estimate your uh, ego motion um, and, and feed it into the architecture. Now, the most exciting part though, is not training this method in a supervised way, but rather in a self-supervised manner by view prediction. So you'll take your map, I'll give you a query viewpoint, or the agent actually will on its own ask itself, what would I see if I go to that query viewpoint? And you know the pose of that viewpoint. And then you ask your network to render the image. Again, all these operations are neural operations. You first orient your map. And by the way, these orientation operations don't have any par parameters. You just fit some rotation and this just with 3D dense um, spatial transformers, you just you know adapt the, the features and you render them and you get an image. And then you will just do L2 uh, distance, uh, pixel distance, all right? And uh, we know this is a horrible objective to spit out images, but but just, um, you know, bear with me for one second here. So that's it. So you're going to do view prediction and you're going to train your architecture. And the question is, <clears throat> um, what is the benefit here? This is not the first architecture that is trained with view prediction. What is the benefit of having 3D neural bottlenecks, right? And I'm pretty sure you guys know because you also have a work called deep voxels. So what we did here is we actually wanted to evaluate how this architecture would do out of distribution, out of the training distribution. So how did we do that? We trained the architecture on scenes, let me, on, on scenes like this one that only have two objects in the scene. I mean, there are toy scenes where inside the simulator right now, uh, and you know, you move around the camera, you train yourself, and then you test your method on scenes that have four objects, all right? And we compared our method with uh, uh, 
neural scene representation and rendering from DeepMind paper, which also does view prediction, but without a 3D bottleneck with 2D or 1D bottlenecks. And what you see is that um, if you don't have such a 3D bottleneck, the, the network still sees two objects. So it cannot actually generalize, all right? Let's run the, again the videos. While if you have a 3D bottleneck, you do see four objects, okay? So you generalize a strong generalization that comes with this 3D bottleneck of, of you know, uh, representing the space uh, correctly in your, not correctly, but in a 3D manner, let's say in your latent uh, space <clears throat> in, the, in the bottleneck of the network, in the hidden state. So um, the problem is that if we do, when we took this method outside of the very, very toy, Simulation environments, and we went to a less toy simulation environment, for example, Carla. Uh, things actually didn't work very well. Some extremely blurry images came out, uh, which is not surprising because, um, I mean, if you change your point, a lot of things can happen, right? There is a tremendous, um, you know, uncertainty and um, stochasticity of how the visual world will look from a different viewpoint, which actually really, really hurts the regression loss. Um, apart from that, a lot of things we don't care actually to represent, like uh, specularities and illumination changes and so on. So instead of actually doing L2, pixel distance, uh, what we decided to do is to do contrastive loss. Uh, so this is our work in ICLR uh, 2020, where we render, again, not an image, a three channel, but rather a 64 channel image with by height by 64. And we take the query view, and we feed it in the 2D CNN, which again trained from scratch. And uh, the loss is pixel wise contrastive loss. So every pixel should be closest in feature distance to its corresponding pixel coming from the top down pathway, as opposed to any other pixel. And again, you need to do the negative sampling and so on and so forth. Um, like we need to sample negatives and any, and, uh, any progress on contrastive losses can also be used in these networks like uh, bootstrap your own latents, for example, that you actually don't need negative samples, but you can have two networks in operating in different speeds and different learning rates, I mean. Um, okay, so so that was uh, when we really gave up on trying to generate images and try to give up on, on actual graphics. But by the way, this contrastive loss can be done both in a 2D space and in a 3D space, depending on how much you lift this query viewpoint, okay? So what is a 3D contrastive loss? Essentially, you take two frames, you create 3D features, match maps from these two views. And you know the corresponding uh, voxels should have nearby feature vectors, and the non-corresponding ones should have far away feature vectors. So that, that's all. And you see that the features that emerge um, without uh, track objects over time. So I'm showing here the 3D feature map. Um, from a bird view. So I'm slicing it and I'm featureizing, I'm colorizing, I'm taking PCA of the feature channels and then showing you the color. And you see that these yellow um, um, circles actually track the cars over time. And we use the same uh, features to track objects here um, uh, over time. And again, you, you never use annotations and you can track uh, the objects uh, reasonably well, okay? So these features essentially do some correspondence over time, despite the fact that they were trained only for correspondences across views, never in a dynamic scene. And I can tell you exactly what are the problems of this architecture and why it doesn't do any better. Um, and the one main problem is that um, when you do this contrastive loss, the network will try to anchor on any context it can to discriminate to voxels, okay? For example, we're gonna anchor on the road. And as you move around, uh, you know, the road changes below you. And so the feature is not gonna be slow enough over time as much as you would like it to, all right? So that's the difference between training directly from dynamic scenes when you learn to be um, invariant to those temporal changes as opposed to, uh, you know, changes only across views. Um, so another thing we did is we just train it supervised. We, let's say, warm start the features and then we train the features for 3D object detection, those 3D feature maps, just by adapting Maskar CNN to in a 3D corresponding architecture. And what you'll see here is that indeed the contrastive loss, which is this red curve, did give a better pre-training in comparison to view prediction, which is the pre predicting pixel colors, right? 
and both of them are better than training from scratch. Okay, so contrastive loss is better than uh, generating images. Okay, uh, because there is always this uh, tension between, and, and this is ongoing, by the way, between generative models that predict images versus contrastive losses, which one gives better representations? I think these questions are still open. It's just in this work, we just saw that the contrastive loss actually did better. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, many problems uh, with this uh, method. One of the biggest ones where the resolution, uh, three degrees are, you know, they don't fit in GPU memory easily. So you need to make the voxel size big. Uh, so what did we do uh, in our recent work? Well, we, we used implicit functions to predict features in a, let's say, continuous, um, in an infinite spatial resolution. So how do we do that? Consider here a voxel, uh, here's one voxel, all right? And pick a point inside that voxel and take the displacements, dx, dy, dz, with respect to the center of the voxel. And now you can train functions, um, which have some parameters here, that take the features of the grid cell and the displacement and spit out occupancy so that you don't have this discretization artifact. But most importantly, uh, feature vectors, exactly what we care about. And uh, this did much, much better than uh, trilinear interpolation. All right, it did much better than trilinear interpolation. No, nothing else changes though. That's all that you need to do. And now instead of uh, rendering 3D feature maps, you have these 3D feature clouds, which you, you know, match in 3D or in 2D. And in 2D, you can do this volumetric rendering and so on and so forth. And uh, so now the representations has higher spatial resolution. And these are some colors that I, I show you. And, and we did much, much better than our previous. Um, so actually, uh, much, much better than our previous method that was operating on voxels. And we also did uh, slightly better than 3D point contrast. I mean, slightly, I mean, sizably better than 3D point contrast, which is a very, you know, decent baseline that does not try to do in painting, right? Just tries to learn contrastively different representations for points from different viewpoints, okay? And again, you can use the same representation as pre-training for VoltNet or some other 3D detector that you like. And again, you're gonna have a big boost uh, versus training from scratch, okay? Which uh, I know that you also have a, a recent paper that shows that, you know, contrastive learning of scene representations does help tremendously on minimizing labeling uh, effort. Um, so the same thing is, is here. The only uh, addition of those uh, networks is that they also do them uh, in painting, let's say for you, and here are object-centric results, and indeed the occupancies that you get, because you can also decode the occupancy out of those feature clouds are nice and smooth, as seen also from the previous works. And then you can also do the volumetric rendering uh, and, and see the corresponding images. Okay, if you don't want to train contrastively, but you want to train with pixel uh, prediction. Um, so this is the first uh, part of the talk. I'm gonna discuss next how to use those feature representations for, for learning object interactions. I'm wondering if you have any questions at this point. Um, super cool. Um, I have one high level question. I mean, how much do you think, I mean, there's the question of the contrastive learning. And then there's also the thing of when you can basically use few predictions for representation learning. Do you know how these losses correlate? Do you do them at the same time, possibly? Okay, uh, so okay, so I think you're you're trying to ask between the comparison between generating image pixels versus generating image features. Is that right? No, because in both saying, cases, yes. Yeah, what I'm saying is, I guess one option is you can use kind of a generative model to synthesize novel views, right? That that would help you to get some sort of features that you can use for whatever representation. And the other one is like this few contrastive learning. Um, can you combine these two things? I mean, this is like super cool. I mean, I don't know what, what I don't know. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm still trying to grasp it a bit, but I mean, basically what I'm thinking is like, when you can synthesize novel views, right? You should get better representation. That's what you're showing. And you can also go ahead and possibly use this then for all kind of, for, for all kind of other down, downstream tasks. Okay. Um, and 
And separately, you're saying, well, if you use contrastive learning for like correspondences between viewpoints and stuff like this, you can do the same thing. Are these, oh, I see. Are these okay. combinable so, in a sense? So let me try to understand. Uh, I think by you, by saying contrastive learning, you mean I have one view, I have to uh, the other view, right? And I say, oh, this feature should be close and this other feature should be far. The, yeah. the, okay, so that's right. So that's exactly what we asked. We said, oh, so many people do this point contrast, right? And in our previous work, we were doing view prediction, which is generating new images. When I talked about contrastive pre prediction, I meant predict the view, but in a feature space and do contrastive loss right there. So it is a generative model. It is a conditional generative model that conditions on a sequence of views or and a query viewpoint and predicts the image, but rather than predicting on a pixel space, it predicts on feature space and rather than matching pixels, matches features. So it is, let's say the generative way of looking at the view contrastive thing that you're talking about, right? Which is what the point contrast baseline does. Does this make sense? Yeah, no, it makes absolute sense. I think that's a cool idea. Great. Now, I think uh, what happened is that I used the title contrastive learning, which people use for, okay, you have to use, uh, learn to, you know, put the features that you see that uh, triangulate to the same 3D physical point close and the other far. And this uh, potentially confused the explanation, but what we're doing, we're generating a new view and we match in a contrastive way. Oh, that, that's what actually is happening in there in the in all, all the methods that I showed about uh, contrastive uh, prediction. And, and that's exactly the only difference between this and the point contrast, which doesn't try to predict a new view, but rather, you know, you have set of views and you learn features based on what you got. All right. Now, having said that, the, um, we had a big gain on object centric doing that over 3D contrast on scene centric. Uh, it's just uh, like 5% five, 5 like a smaller uh, gap, let's say. Okay. Um, okay, great. Yes, I I'm glad we clarified that. Um, Thanks a lot. Yeah, uh, so, so, so I'll move on then um, and see what can we do with those 3D feature representations since what we said is that their big gain is that can be trained end to end uh, for a final downstream task. So what tasks we can train them on? Um, here is something that I got, uh, I was very interested in since 2016, how objects move under force applications. Uh, here I'm showing you the results of uh, learning long-term visual dynamics collision proposal interaction networks, which is in this ICLR 2021 from, from Berkeley. And it's just one um, method, the most recent that I have seen of the general, uh, you know, recipe of, uh, you want to predict how objects are going to move, take the C, detect the objects, um, take features inside the object boxes, fit them into a graph network and predict their future motion trajectories. Okay, so this is what people have been doing for the last um, three, four years on predicting how objects move under force applications. What is the problem with that? A problem with this is that uh, all those methods are in a 2D space. So there are complications happening from occlusions and the fact that you actually do not see very well the object under specific viewpoints. So what these methods usually do is that either they assume that everything happens in a bird view or everything happens in such a frontal parallel view and so on. Um, well, I mean, it's much easier and much more natural to simulate the world in a 3D space. Because if you simulate the world in a 3D space, um, things that look dramatically different in 2D, they're just the same in 3D and they just move around, right? So it's easier to explain the pixels just by moving uh, and rotating objects, basically. So I think this is a big plus. Um, and yes, and these 3D networks that we discussed do that. So let's see how we can apply these networks instead. So we'll take a scene and then we'll lift it. Uh, we'll put this GRNN, we call it geometry recurring neural network, and we'll get a feature map. And this feature map can be from one view or from multiple views. So you can just fit a single view and the Network is going to learn to complete that 3D feature map by pre-training with view prediction. And then we can train 3D detectors there and detect the objects, right? And here are the different objects. And now I'll fit them into a graph network that operates in 3D as opposed to 2D, which means that it predicts the 3D rotations and 3D translations of objects and uh, adds them to the current location and renders the new 3D feature map and so on and so forth. Um, and now that's it. So 
very similar to what everybody, what we have been doing so far with 2D uh, planar scenes, but actually in 3D. Um, okay, so what happens here? Let's see. So things. So this is what I'm showing something here, like the robot is trying to push things around and objects are dropping down. You're trying to do what's happening. And you are thinking in a 3D space. In a, you try to lift it and think in a 3D space. So one benefit, at least, that you get from that is that as you vary the viewpoint of the same scene, no matter from where you see from this viewpoint or that viewpoint or that viewpoint, the same things will happen. Um, OK, so the, your network will generalize. And indeed, when we compared in the results with two diversions, the biggest difference came when you change the viewpoint that this network could adapt much better than the 2D network, let's say, or, or even in unseen viewpoints. Um, so here is you leave objects to drop down, and we can predict what's happening exactly in the same way. And uh, so, so now you can compare against some baseline. So one baseline is just forget about objects, just keep track only of their centroids and put a graph and figure out what they're going to do. And the other is model the visual appearance, but in 2D space, exactly the method that I described to you. And here it models the objects, but in a 3D uh, space. Um, and you feed them into a graph network and try to predict what's going to happen next. And now that you have a dynamics model that can tell you where objects can go, you can use exactly the same thing to move objects to desired locations. Um, now, ideally, you want to do that not for just very simple pushing actions, which were the data set that we described, but rather also more complicated actions. But that's all we have. And things that translate also in the real world without needing to pre-train, uh, because these 3D features do not actually change dramatically. And the good thing is that you don't need to pay much attention on how you're going to place your camera viewpoint, because you can always uh, adjust to it with the 3D feature maps. Um, OK, so you can do some essentially model predictive control and uh, guess the sequence of actions to put the objects in place. Now, what more can we do? Um, looking more into how we can manipulate objects, we will see that there are two main um, I mean, there are some variations, but the two main families are of methods of going from the world to an action is that either you'll feed object locations and poses as input to your network, and you'll predict actions. And a lot of reinforcement learning methods do that. They take a scene, they assume they know where the objects are, where is their objects and locations and poses, and they feed this into the network that predicts actions. And the other is, image to action directly, image or concatenated frames. And there are many, many methods, again, doing this one. And um, there are pros and cons in both the representations of the world. All right, well, what we're trying to ask here is what is the right representation for a scene for efficient policy search? The good thing here is that, of course, it's very low dimensional. The only thing you have is three numbers of the location of the object of its pose, potentially the velocity, rotational velocity, and so on. Um, and here you have images. And um, of course, it's much faster to learn here, but you cannot generalize because you're actually blind. You don't model how objects look like. You only um, model the centroids uh, and their um, velocities and so on. Here, you can, in principle, generalize because you look at the images. But in practice, this is very hard. You require an enormous amount of data to do so. So some representations that we have been uh, exploring is the following. Uh, first of all, we are object-centric or entity-centric. So for now, an entity is an object, but it can be like a constellation of objects. We spit out some 3D features, so we canonicalize it in a coordinate frame. And then we select, based on those features, which policy to use. And this policy operates on the low-dimensional representations of the object. But because the routing, the routing mechanism here actually looks at visual features, it's OK, uh, this behavior policy here to be to operate on low dimensional space, because different objects could just be routed to different behaviors. Um, yeah, and uh, things look uh, like this. Would, uh, you have the image, you lift it in a 3D feature map, you transform it, make sure the ground plane is indeed on the bottom, so you are not. Uh, you can handle different viewpoints here. And you crop the object, and then you train your routing network, and you train your routing network for trial and error. You say, okay, let me try this behavior one on this object. You see if you succeeded, 
If you don't succeed, you say, okay, don't put them close. So every policy, for every policy here, for every behavior, we call it behavior, you also train a key. So there is some attention here between the object features and the policy learn features, and you learn both so that the retrieval mechanism essentially retrieves the right behavior to manipulate a specific object. Um, and this trial and error is very, very efficient because you don't need to learn thousands and thousands of parameters of a network that takes you from image to actions. The only thing that you need to learn is these um, uh, here, th these uh, features to do this essentially routing, all right? So we tried this in uh, uh, grasping and pushing, and uh, here is how it looks. So for example, we have grasping, we have some behavior here, we hard coded here, some controller, and we learn features to say that, yeah, this behavior is successful on this type of object. And this behavior two is actually successful on this type of object. And this behavior three is actually successful on this type of object, okay? And these are very general controllers. They're very easy to hard code. And the only thing you need to do on top of them is to learn the routing. Now, ideally, learning should also be done in the design of the controllers, right? Um, that's absolutely correct. Another thing you can do by looking at the uh, excellent work on uh, grasping where they predict proposals, right? Of where you can grasp and so on is you just look at the 3D features of that object in the neighborhood and figure out which proposal is good for each particular uh, situation. But in any case, this decomposition of how things look and what behaviors can manipulate them actually can lead to very efficient uh, learning, uh, let's say. Um, and uh, we call this method visually grounded library of behaviors. Here is the visually grounded library of behaviors, and it did uh, better on pushing diverse objects to diverse initial from diverse initial and final conditions and under diverse viewpoints in comparison to um, you know, just using XYZ, using images, as I said earlier, or trying to use those. 3D feature maps directly to go from those big 3D feature maps to actions, okay? So, so our initial goal, which we tried very hard, is instead of feeding images to actions, just train another homongous network, but we'll take those big 3D feature maps and map them to actions. And we actually fail tremendously because this is very expensive to learn. And while for this can be done in simulation because you know the 2D networks can be pretty short, this network is actually big and fat, has lots of 3D convolutions and the memory it takes a lot of memory and so on, so you couldn't actually done so many samples. So we had to think of something more sample efficient to do. And that's why we thought about this routing uh, way of, um, of uh, manipulating objects for pushing and grasping at least. Um, and yeah, for example, in comparison to Dextet that has only this top-down grasper, we can grasp plates that are very, very low because you can have controllers. And the only thing you need to learn is yeah, for plate looking things, use this controller number six, for example. Um, yes, so another thing that we saw is that this routing, the input for this routing is important to have 3D features as opposed to 2D to be able to handle variability in viewpoint. So we took also pre-trained Im image and features and trained the routing with those features, um, but fine tuning the 3D features did much better than 2D. And another thing we realized is that there's no general 3D feature representation that for every task, different features make sense. For example, for the sake of grasping, this mug here and potentially something else that is a box, they can you can pick them up the same way. Now for the same of for the sake of pushing, then maybe they're different. Or for the sake of putting something inside again, they're different. So for every task, we learn different feature representations. I mean, this is work uh, under uh, this ongoing work. Uh, and these are things that we're trying to think of how to generalize uh, manipulation across viewpoints and different objects. All right. Um, OK. Um, are there any questions on that? Or shall, shall I just jump directly on the last uh, part, uh, which is, uh, yeah, 3D and language uh, ground? You can just go ahead. OK. OK, yeah. Great. Um, OK, so language understanding, language understanding. Uh, in 2018, 
we started, uh, we had this idea that, that, that we thought that we can train visual detectors, visual classifiers to supply rewards for policy learning. So you want, for example, to place the can to the right of the ball. Instead of making an environment simulator where you hard code uh, when the can is to the right of the ball and so on, you'll say, I'll have visual detectors and uh, these visual detectors will take the image. And when the can is not to the right of the ball, we'll have low score. And when it is, we'll have high score. And you can use those visual detectors for reward learning and to do your reinforcement learning, for example. So instead of just having this, um, here is the agent that interacts with the environment and the state changes, and here is the circle of RL. Instead of having those hard-coded rewards, we'll just have learned rewards. I mean, this is a very reasonable, sounded like a very reasonable idea. So instead of manually coding the rewards, we want to detect them from the RGB image. Now, it turned out we managed to do that. And our classifier essentially, what it did is detected two objects and it took the pairwise uh, features of the box and we fit them into a neural network and we learned to say yes, no. And here's the result. In, very, in a very, very simple scene, the can is to the right of the book. And now let's see what's going to happen. Oh, well, you pick it up and you put it in the back and the score goes down. And then you put even, yeah, and here the score now is down. So that's what we learned. And we try to use that for guiding some network to put things to the left and to the right, inside, and so on and so forth. Um, now, the conclusions from this work are that this uh, reward detector essentially did not generalize very well across camera placements. I, by the way, this was work before our 3D feature representations. Like uh, as you change the viewpoint, the reward detector would, would fail. Um, and the other important thing is that training a policy, trying to find a policy of how to put something A inside B, using just sparse binary words, it does take enormous amount of samples, which is true. I mean, it's no surprise. We know that reinforcement learning from sparse rewards uh, does take a lot of um, samples, a lot of samples. And the other thing that we really didn't like is that somebody could say, I put the Coca-Cola inside the mug inside the Coca-Cola and our network will not be able to say, actually, this doesn't make sense. I cannot put the mug inside the Coca-Cola, right? So uh, while well, the Coca-Cola inside the mug makes sense. So we wouldn't have a network that has some basic common sense of what's a plausible goal or what's not a plausible goal. Okay. so. Uh, and it turns out that uh, at that time, we also read this paper, Symbol Grounding and Meaning and Comparison of High Dimensional and Embodying Theories of Meaning, which was complaining about how word coherences as a way to figuring out common sense is not actually the way humans are reason about what's plausible and what's implausible in the world. And they gave the following examples. After waiting barefoot in the lake, Eric used his shirt to drive his feet versus after waiting barefoot in the lake, Eric used his glasses to drive his feet. And here the linguists say, the authors that these two sentences are identical grammatically and syntactically and have almost the same words, but humans understand that one makes sense and the other doesn't make sense. And this is kind of rare uh, sentences. You may not, uh, the word coherence may not guide you on, oh yeah, this word coherence a lot, this means they make sense. Oh, this word don't coherence, it doesn't make sense, right? So we do it in a different way. We don't reason about uh, word uh, coherences. And here's another example that we like about using a newspaper to protect your face from the wind versus using a matchbox, which is much smaller. Actually, you cannot use a matchbox to protect your face from the wind. And then we also thought, ah, how nice it would be if we could do the same inference from the ball inside the cube versus the cube inside the ball, right? Where the ball inside the cube doesn't make sense. Um, yeah. So, so, so now the question is, so there is this conjecture that the linguists put forward called simulation semantics, that the way humans derive semantics from language is by simulation. They simulate the content um, by essentially inferring objects and percepts that have appearance and shape and geometry and other properties, um, similar to things that we use during perception and control. So we think visually to make sense of language, they, according to them. Um, and the question is, what we've been doing so far with grounding language on 2D boxes and CNN features and so on, 
is not actually the right way to do the simulation because 2D boxes and CNN features are themselves ungrounded. They don't know, for example, how big is my pen, right? They can be, yeah, they don't. So while 3D features potentially that are stable, they're permanent, they have size information, they persist over time, right? Potentially they're better constructs on grounding language. So that's what uh, we thought. So, so then what did we do? Uh, we do two things. We train two types of networks, classifiers and generators that give in the language sentence, the green rubber cylinder on the right of the blue ball and so on would do two things. One is they would generate the scene visually to see if what you're saying make any sense. And the other is, so imagine there's no scene and you just talk to me and you told me the green rubber cylinder is on the right of the blue ball. I can generate a scene that in incarnates what you're telling me, like uh, realizes what you're telling me if I can, or I'm going to tell you, I don't think it makes sense. For example, you may tell me the black pen is to the left of the purple, and the purple is uh, to the left of the blue, whatever. And the blue is actually to the right of the black. And then I'm going to tell you, I cannot realize this configuration. It's impossible. So we would like a system that was able to say, um, I think this is impossible. Uh, so we'll see how to do that. And the second is just grounders. I have the scene, I have the language, and I ref you know, ground the re reference on the scene. So generators and identifier networks we trained in the following way. Instead of having images paired with language, we assume we had a scene paired with language. So you could see that scene from different viewpoints. And when you see the scene from different viewpoints, then you can train those lifting networks that go from 2D images to 3D feature maps. And when you do that, then you can have objects in terms of 3D feature maps. So now your generative networks that uh, will go from language to 3D scene features, right? They're going to do this generation process. They will condition their conditional VAEs, essentially, um, that take as input green rubber cylinders or your noun phrase, and they spit out a 3D feature map that, when rendered, essentially gives you a green rubber cylinder. And here's another generative network that uh, takes only blue ball, and again, spits another 3D feature map that, when rendered, it gives you a blue ball. Um, so these are our... Uh, these are generated networks for noun phrases. Now for pairwise, you need to tell me left of, in front, behind, and so on. And what I'm gonna spit out is a dx, dy, dz, like the displacement between two entities. So now I can generate a scene. Uh, you can tell me the green rubber cylinder and the blue ball and so on. And I'm gonna place the entities in the right location. So essentially I have this procedural way of generating a scene. I dump every entity on the predicted offset. And um, when things don't make sense, I sample and sample again and again and again. And you know what? Now you can tell me as long phrases as you like. I assume I have a parse tree of your language, of your utterance, and I'm going to just add in more and more objects in the scene. Uh, and then when I render them, you'll see this blur because, uh, and I'm rendering in pixels, so I'll be able for you to see what I'm doing. But despite the fact that it's super blurry, so you don't know if this is a circle or a cylinder or whatever, the, the nearest neighbors of the features you're generating, if I do nearest neighbors, I do retrieve the correct meshes if I have a library of meshes. And indeed, your imaginations don't need to be pixel accurate. They just need to be some features that these features will index in the correct, let's say, entities. Um, so we have the neural rendering that I told you is exactly the same as before, or the blender rendering, which is nearest neighbor type of blender. And now I can imagine, I can imagine a lot of different things. Here are my imaginations. I can show them to you from different viewpoints. And I can add many, many objects, as many objects as I want. And I'm not going to be adding objects on top of another object because I'm going to do 3D cross intersection constraint check. And now you may say, but uh, 3D cross intersection is just one constraint of what can make things possible versus not possible. And this is absolutely true. Uh, so more physics and this simulation ideally needs to learn more physics about the world and so on. Um, but yeah, uh, so essentially as I'm generating the scene, I make sure I don't make objects that intersect one another in 3D because this is just violates the physics laws. Um, and uh, we evaluate these representations in the classification of plausible versus implausible scenes. Yes, A to the left of B makes sense and B to the left of C makes sense and C now to the 
left of A, it doesn't make sense. I cannot make this configuration and I'm going to tell you, all right? So I have a way of thinking and verifying things that you are telling me to generate, okay? Now, that's one thing that you can do with generative networks. Another thing you can do is that you can alter a specific scene. Um, yeah, for example, here I just added an object in a scene that already exists. Um, yeah, so either I can generate from scratch or I can generate condition on a particular image that I see right now through this uh, specific process that first I need to predict what you're telling me, then I ground the reference in your expression in objects in the scene, and then I predict where I need to put the new generated object. Uh, and this is very important for policy search because each time you tell me, put now the pen in the mug, then I'll take that pen, put in the mug, give it to you as a configuration and say to your policy search algorithm, this is the goal that I want you to generate. And now the goal becomes a 3D scene as opposed to either an image or some binary, yes, no, detector that you have no clue how close you are and so on. Uh, it's much easier to have a 3D goal configuration as your goal, right? And you can imagine, yes, this is exactly what I want to reach to. Um, uh, and, and I'll show you now how you used it. Now, so these are the generative networks. And to do this scene alteration, you are supposed to also have identifying networks. So the discriminative networks that actually given the language and the scene detect the reference. Uh, for example, we need to find the red metal cylinder, which I think is this guy, to the left behind of the red rubber cylinder, which is this guy, yeah. And indeed, uh, we can do very good uh, 3D differential object detection simply because in 3D, even under close occlusions, uh, the features are not that corrupted as opposed to do this. So with this is a mask RCNN doing the same thing with the same method. Um, so these are 3D proposals and see that these are 2D proposals. And the last thing I want to show is how do we use exactly these uh, methods where the goal is the 3D scene that we're trying to hit. And you can use a, a simple, very simple policy search algorithms like ILQR um, to essentially, uh, you know, imagine the configuration and use it as a, you know, as your cost, your quadratic cost to drive uh, policy search. All right. So this is the benefit of not having the goal being a yes, no detector as we did in our previous work, but rather being imagined as the complete configuration you are describing me. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and again, these representations can generalize across different viewpoints and so on. Um, okay, so to be honest, we still uh, we are still working on this language grounding um, direction. We're still working on this language grounding direction. One thing that we did uh, recently is to um, hmm, is to use those representations for general uh, visual question answering. And how do we do that? Well, we train prototype dictionaries for color and shape categories for the objects in the scene. And I'll tell you exactly what we did. Imagine you have an image and you're asking the question, what is the color of the object to the right of the broccoli? We'll follow neural module networks where we have a parser that takes your question and spits out a sequence of neural modules. More neural modules like find, an object, find the object, filter based on the shape, filter based on color and so on. I'm gonna show you. We have learned style and shape prototypes by disentangling 3D feature maps into color and shape in an unsupervised way using uh, um, adaptive distance normalization operations. So here's your question. What I'm going to do, I'm going to feed my parser and I'm going to spit out the program. And here my program has three modules, neural modules, filter shape, relate to the right, relate has to do with spatial arrangements and query the style, ask what style it is. Uh, that's why we say, what is the color? So I'll take my image, I'll, Visual parsing essentially means run your GRNN and uh, detect the objects and disentangle each object into a styling, into a shape, style, and location. Okay, and um, and then once you have your scene in such a disentangle representation, then you just go ahead and run your modules. You say, okay, which one matches to the broccoli prototype? 
you take the broccoli prototype and you compare it with all the shapes for all the objects that you found. And this comparison for the shape is rotation aware. That's you see, that's why you see the objects rotating around. Here you say, okay, I found the broccoli. Now we're going to say, I want to figure out what is to the right of that. And then you take the locations and you ask and you figure out which one is to the right. And then the last thing that you do is, okay, what is the color of that? And you're like, I know what's the color. I already have it from my disentangler presentation. Um, so I, I don't want to go into details here because I just don't have the time. But basically, if you have networks that take 2D images and speed 3D disentangler representations, it's very easy to get a neural module network to work. Okay. And indeed, you are able to do that with very, very few training examples. And you can do visual question answering. And the important thing is that you can just have only 10 training examples and you do much, much better than you know previous works uh, that operate in 2D. All right. Um, yeah, and, and, and we do believe that 3D representations may be kind of important for such generalization. So here you see here one shot test set where we add more objects and so on, novel objects on questions about novel objects in the scene and so on and so forth. Um, so these are some preliminary thoughts. We're still trying to figure out what is the right way to do permanence. What is the right way that I see a keyboard from one viewpoint and I see the full keyboard in my mind, all right? Um, how do we handle dynamic scenes and um, occlusions and so on? How do we scale up the library of behaviors for manipulation? How do we learn general dynamics models beyond pushing and so on? And how do we have an open language vocabulary as opposed to this super simple language domain that I just described? Um, yeah, so all the work that I um, described is done by uh, my students here, Fish Adam, here, Shamid Ziam. And these are the papers that actually I mentioned in case you want to take a look. Uh, thank you very much again, and I am looking forward to your questions. Cool, awesome, fantastic. Um, do we have any questions on Zoom? Um, if so, just unmute yourself and ask a question, I guess. Uh, hey, I have a question regarding this contrastive learning for training because I'm also doing that kind of work. And I'm curious, have you observed some really, like, because it's called transfer learning, you really want to tra like transfer some features from the pre-training task to a downstream task. But have you observed if you can really transfer, like you're pre-training on very different data, let's say if you're pre-training on the indoor scene, but do the downstream task on the outdoor scene, can you, do, yeah. do you think it's really transferable in this way? Yeah, without any additional fine tuning, right? Uh, I mean, you can do fine tuning a bit or without or future learning. Yeah, yeah. Learning. So to be completely honest, uh, I don't think that these are the right representations. Overall, I don't think there are any good representations for a uh, good transfer. Uh, I think the power of those self-supervised losses is that you can take your outdoor data and without any labels train mm -hmm. your network without uh, anything, right? You just run around yeah, yeah, yeah. points and condition it. Yeah. Um, I think for transfer, dramatically different architectures need to be found. Uh, I don't think, uh, I mean, of course you can do insane amount of augmentations. That's what people do, right? They augment, they yeah. augment, they augment mm -hmm. uh, and so on. I think 3D helps you with distortions, like projected distortions, how what's gonna happen if the camera changes, if you go too close or too far. So in that way, you have some canonical representations. Um, but uh, I, I think we need way more modular network architectures that uh, other than CNN with fat receptive fields for, for good transfer. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks. Thanks for your opinion. Uh, hey, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Katarina, hey, um, it's Dave here. Um, I wonder like, if you can answer some question about this grounding things. So um, so I'm very curious with grounding things in the real world environment. So um, also I'm very fascinated by the work that you do such things in synthetic things. So I'm wondering if there's a way to say, train this common sense grounding schedules, say this things to the right of something, this kind of spatial relations in a complete synthetic things. And then you somehow you transfer it to some 
real world scenarios, say on scanning things, because yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So we tried, uh, for example, the scan referring data set. Uh, yeah. yeah. So there, if you assume that your object detections are great, like uh, you have detected objects and even the labels are good, then you can have perfect uh, performance because these classifiers are based on 3D uh, relationships. So to the left or in front, behind, the furthest from, you can come up with neural modules for all of those and you can have perfect performance. Um, the hard part is the object detection and the labeling essentially, right? As well as handling natural language. Um, uh, but, but natural language, I mean, there are ways that you can handle it, right? Like for example, paraphrasing and things like this. If you can go to the parse tree, because from the parse tree, you can go to the program, let's say, or to train your parser to go from natural language to program. Um, yeah, I think the hard part there is the detection of the objects, right? And, and their labelings. So we try to do something more integrated right now that is not like, okay, here is the objects and they're detected. Now, you know, parse the, the scene and so on. We try to do something more integrated, but we don't have any results on, on this yet. But, but yes, the spatial classifiers are perfect. They generalize super well, exactly because they're only based on 3D uh, distance and so on. Yeah, thanks. I don't think we can hear you, Angie. I know you're unmuted, but I think your microphone doesn't work. Let, let me ask a question in between. There was one question on YouTube, actually. Um, so if you if you basically uh, ground the 3D scene with language, right? And then from different viewpoints, like let's say you flip the whole thing, right? You, you rotate like by 180 degrees. How, how robust is the model basically in this case? Like, like right, so you, you, you just go around 180, you have the same constellation, you go around, would it flip that? If you have a 3D scene, you could probably even try that out, right? Yeah. Uh, one second, let me try to understand what is uh, the question here. I think the question is, we have a scene mm -hmm. and then you do your lifting, right? And mm -hmm. then you go around uh, how many degrees, right? Uh, first of all, the right way to use the model is, as you go around, you just dump more features uh, but uh, you know what I mean? And then your 3D feature map is updated, you redetect the objects and everything is fine. Um, but basically the other way to go around is that, okay, I know I have this map. Now the only thing that is changing is my camera viewpoint. So I go and see everything from the other side. Uh, the left and right will be flipped. Uh, but, but other than that, the, the things persist supposedly, right? So it all depends on how good your ego motion is. But I think the whole point of those representations is that they persist despite how you're moving, um, right? Actually, I have, a, I, have an, I have an unrelated question. Well, kind of related. So, so Dave, uh, I don't know if you know Dave. So Dave, he's done the scan refer stuff, right? So, um, so we, we thought about um, doing spatial relation predictions from language and viewpoints. And it was, so one thought we had is, how much data do we think we need to annotate to, to make a network learn anything reasonable? Because it's super hard. Like, I don't know, we have like, how many annotations do we have, Dave? Like 50,000 or so? Oh, yes, roughly, yes. How many do we need actually to get like spatial? We would love to learn full spatial understanding, like just by language, but obviously 50,000 is not enough, right? Okay. Uh, what do second. you think? How much, how much do, we, do you think we should annotate? Uh huh. Um, uh, do you refer to the data set from Leo Gibas that had done something with Scanet and uh, referential expressions? No. Um, so Dave's data set is the scan, uh, is, uh, the scan refer one. Basically, we have uh, ScanNet and we have about 50,000 annotations for these ones, right? So Dave has released this benchmark very recently. Uh -huh. um, and the, the thing what we wanted to do is we basically wanted to go ahead and say, well, give me, a, give me an image. Tell me which viewpoint this image has been recorded from, right? Or like figure out some... Like, and the, or the other way around, basically, if you change the camera, have a generative model that generates your descriptions, that would change slightly as you rotated it. And we tried that and for binary stuff like left and right, this works. This is not so, I mean, it's, it's not easy, but it's doable. Um, and then we, we realized, well, okay, we just probably need a lot more data, but is it like 500,000, 5 million, 500 million? <laughs> but once again, uh, the, the input is an image or a scene or a 3D scene, for example, and the output is a caption. 
So, so in this case, the input would be um, an image relative to a scene, but you could rotate around it, right? So you could okay. basically, like, so like the way you generate the image is basically you go around and see like different objects in a, in a scene, like in Scanner or so, you would see it from different um, uh, directions, right? And the question there would be, how would the captions change, of course, that you're generating, right? So you would expect that the spatial correlations, they are very few dependent. Yes. And yeah, so th this was, so they've played around with this a little bit and it was very difficult actually to get a meaningful signal that goes beyond like left and right, basically what people do in images. Right, but what about in front and behind and on top and so on and next? Yeah, didn't, this was difficult. <laughs> Yeah, but, but, but it depends on your, the architecture of your network, right? So, um, for example, do we assume the objects are uh, detected? Do we assume object boxes given or? Yeah, we assume ground truth in this case, just to make it simple. Yeah, so now that you have ground truth, you can take every two objects and spit out their special relationship. Yeah, right? we tried that, but the problem is it's going to overfit very quickly because we quote unquote only have 50,000 annotations. It was just not enough to, to train it. I mean, maybe we've done something wrong, but this was at least our. What is the input to, to this classifier? Oh, we tried two things. We tried it on points and on images, right? You can you can take a point cloud and then from the point cloud try to basically see from which viewpoint uh, change the viewpoint, right? And then you have different different point clouds based on the viewpoint, and then you would expect you get different uh, descriptions of both objects and or the entire scene. I agree, but the truth is that uh, how two objects are related only depends on their centroids. Mm -hmm. All right, so you can just feed the classifier that, that takes us input centroids. Now, yeah, yeah. Right? that's what we've done, right? Like this is literally what we're doing, but it overfits so quickly. The, the problem was, we, I think we don't have enough data at this point that it generalizes very well. At least that was our experience. Like for, for simple okay. things like left and I right, see. it worked, but for anything else, we just didn't have enough captions, I think. Yeah, I see, I see. So I think what you're trying to say is that learning A in front of B is difficult because I don't have a lot of annotations of what is A in front of B. And, and they are very imbalanced because basically if you're asking Turkers to do that, you're getting a lot of annotations that tell you left and right, but you're getting very few Turkers that tell you in front and back. Got it. But now, now here's the thing. For in front of back, you can programmatically generate synthetic data as many as you want because we know what's in front of back. It means that one object is here and the other is behind it. So you can actually generate synthetic data, imagine objects, and put them in front and back. You're going to learn perfect classifiers. Now, the same thing is for left and right. A harder thing is on, on and on below. Uh, depends if you treat the objects as bounding boxes. If you try to train classifiers on centroids, the problem with this approach is that although it's going to capture very well, for example, a table and a mug on top of it, because you know, look, the bounding box is one below and the other above, um, somebody on a chair like me, because I'm actually inside the bounding box of the chair, uh, may not actually work. So you may need to have different representations. Either you need to append the category or like give up on centroids and do something other fancy thing, um, potentially. Uh, but I mean, for behind and so on and so forth and left and right, you do not need to annotate them. You can just generate synthetic data programmatically because you know what, uh, what, what this means. And then you'll see how it's, it's going to transfer because you're just using object centroids. But, but how do you generate the captions for it? Um, no, you just you just say, oh, I'm going to generate now tons of data of veins on, in front of B, and you generate them and you train a classifier, and then you fire that classifier. And you say, okay, look, now I can give me you give me any pair of objects, and I can predict for you which one is in front of which. Oh, I see. Okay, that one I can see that this works. But I guess the task there was a little different, right? The task is give me some actual human-like descriptions of the scene arrangements. And, and then it's a lot harder because we like we tried some augmentation, right? Of course, right? You take some sentence and trying to figure out how to go back and forth, but it was very uh -huh. difficult because that that's you can't you can't generate this so easily, I think. Uh, yes, sense. I agree. Uh, but 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 the important thing is that I mean, who cares what the humans say? I mean, it's good given two objects to be able to say which one is in front of which, right? Mm, and, and these classifiers we can train and they can generalize. Uh, do you do you agree? And, yeah, and no, I fully agree with you. But the setting what we had was slightly different, right? We had basically this like I don't know. You, let, let's say you have an app. You're going around in the mall or so, and the app should tell the user, oh, be, like go to the left because there's an object in front of another object, right? And like this kind of natural, if you're doing it with actual natural descriptions, then it becomes a lot harder because you you have you you need these annotations, I think, in a larger scale. Um, right, right. I think what you're saying is like 
Otherwise, you are going to predict everything in front of everything, and you're going to tell the user, look, this in front of this, and this in front of this, and this in front of this, and you know, yeah. there are just too many things in front of uh, other. Uh, okay, uh, well, still you can decompose uh, the problem. As a, it also depends on the task, what this uh, guy is um, looking for, right? So, what? Yeah, but I guess, yeah. right, like, I mean, we, we really care about this, like, scene description task, in a sense, yeah. of give me a scene, tell me the description, and then change the few points, and then figure out how the descriptions change. And because the, the, the challenge, what you have is like, I don't know, let's say you, you have a phone call, right? And the problem is you're telling somebody what's going on. And even you see the phone call, it's all relative to the current viewpoint. So we hope we could automatically generate natural descriptions and kind of an, help you to navigate your model. And it turns out it's really difficult, but we would love to actually expand on this, what we have right now. Um, but we, we don't know basically how much data we would need. And it's, it's not so clear well, there's like left and right, there's in front and back. That's the easy ones in principle still. And then it becomes more complicated when, you, when you're saying, I don't know, <laughs> you have like two objects to the right, you have one in the back and you have like, and you're formulating these kind of sentences makes the whole problem very difficult. The network has to understand counting suddenly. Yeah. And you know, I mean, you know the problems, right? It just gets a lot more complicated. I mean, the object detection, I'm pretty sure is also very, not un unreliable, I would say, right? Um, and, and also which object is relevant for me to mention to you, right? To this yeah, agency, yeah. understanding what you're expecting and not to mention some irrelevant thing. Uh, yeah. I think this also is uh, hard. Now, spatial classification is, I would say, the easy part, right? Uh, selecting what to tell to the user, I think, uh, as you said, is, uh, is hard, uh, right? You have a lot, you have imagined an over description of the scene and you want to select few things to mention to the user that he'd like. Uh, and potentially this filtering, right, of the relevant information we should be able to do using your, your data set, for example, right? Mm -hmm. cool. yeah, I think um, maybe any other questions before I'm dominating the whole discussion? Um, we can take one last one before we, uh, we're already a little bit over time. Okay. Maybe no other questions. Um, I would really like to thank you. Um, I, I mean, you, you see that this is obviously super interesting. I, I could probably talk with you for hours. I think this is a really uh, fascinating area and your work is really, really impressive, actually. I really like it. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you very much for having me. For being with us. Um, I'm going to end the stream for the time being. Okay, All right, stream is ended. So now it's the. Um,